Hello, hello. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good morning, maybe. Thank you so much for joining this From Home event that today I am conducting. My name is Vanessa Vasquez. I am your Hago Lima City guide. And we are going today to visit with the help of a pre recorded video, an official pre-recorded video, one of the most famous museums of Peru. This is the Larco Museum, Museo Larco. One of the highlights in my Lima City tours in person. So I hope you are able to enjoy this little guided tour into one of my favorite museums, one of the best museums we have in Peru. And today we're going to be using a video that is actually public in the Facebook, in the official Facebook of Larco Museum. So I will give you all the information about how to get into this uh, Facebook uh, platform and also um, how you can see the video in its full extent. So first of all, let me say hi to all the nice voyagers that are participating. Thank you so much, by the way, for coming, for visiting Lima and staying here with me for 45 minutes. That's going to be the length of this tour. Hola, amigos. Hola, Adrian, Julie, A.V. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for coming. This is your first tour, Julie. Oh my gosh, this is extra special. Thank you so much for coming and, and spending uh, this, this really a special occasion because this is your first tour with Hago. I hope so. I hope you enjoy the concept. Our tours here on Hago are all free to join, free to enjoy, and just tip supported. So if you have the chance uh, to support a tour with a tip, that is super fantastic. If not, of course, we understand the idea is to get to show you the world and the world where, where well, the country is the world where we live in each part of, the, of, of planet Earth. And we want as tour guides to open a little bit of the heart of our countries, our cities, to you all. So, hola, hola, amigos. Hello, Judy, Christy. Hi, Jane. Hi, Bernhard. Hello, amigo. Hi. Thanks, Adrian, Martin, Jane, Francis, or oh, um, Julie. Uh, please come as many times as you as you wish to Lima. And if you have the chance, also, my friends, to to follow my channel, that would be super great. In the upper part, you're going to find a follow button. I do tours of Lima. I am an official tour guide in the city of Lima. Uh, this is my home and I've been doing tours for several years, over 15 years. Uh, in 2020, I decided to, uh, to start doing tours in a different way. And thanks to Hago, I was able to do them virtually. It was my dream for a long time. So uh, now I try to combine in-person tours outside in the city and lectures from home. So, well, thanks a lot for joining. And we are going first to start with this event. This is, as I was saying in the description of this event, uh, is a pre recorded recorded video of a tour that was uh, made in the museum uh, by the very uh, director of the museum. So um, the video is in Spanish, so that's why I decided uh, to translate part of this circuit into English, so in that way more people will be able to learn from the beauty uh, in the museum and the speech of the director also. She's an archaeologist, so the way she explains things is amazing. I am a super fan of her work. And we're going to get to know a little bit about this uh, person, about the director of, of the museum, and also the history of the museum, and in particular about the exhibit. So um, first of all, uh, I would like to give you an idea of where you can find the video, the full length video is in the Facebook of Museum Larco, Museo Larco. Uh, and it's open but uh, to everyone, it's free, but um, it is only in Spanish, right? So um, today I will be 
hitting the highlights of this video. Uh, and if you like this type of events, let me know at the end, please, uh, because there are other museums in Peru that uh, have also this, this uh, sort of like visits, virtual visits, but only in Spanish. So I can translate some of these events uh, uh, to, to you all. So, well, I think it is time to start with this, um, let's say, um, a tour in Larco Museum. I do these tours regularly in person. Uh, I take travelers to, to this museum very often. So um, uh, doing videos inside, like me going with a gimbal is basically impossible. No, it's, it's not really like every museum would like ask guys to do that. But as well, uh, as, as long as they do it, that's really, you know, it's okay. It's understandable. Sometimes they want to show the museum. So we're going to take advantage of this today and uh, we'll translate a, a little bit of the whole uh, experience to you. So, well, let's start with this visit, this virtual visit to Larco Museum. So, and, and by the way, uh, first of all, I would like to explain to you a little bit of what we're going to see today. This uh, tour uh, that was made uh, a, a couple of weeks ago by the director of the museum, the lady you are seeing there uh, is Ula Holmquist Pachas. She is a Peruvian archaeologist from University Católica, and uh, she is the director of the museum. She's the one also that has, in a way, uh, created also the whole, um, let's say, um, a circuit uh, and, and the and the story uh, that is narrated uh, in the in the official speech of the uh, museum, also the one official tour guides nowadays uh, have and, and we uh, deliver to the visitors. Uh, the place where the museum is located is an old house, is an old hacienda from the 18th century, from the uh, 1700s. Uh, so the house you see there, which has been also modified, it has been adapted to be a museum, amplify in some sections, uh, is also has been modified in the uh, 1950s with elements, decorative elements from traditional houses from Trujillo in the north coast of Peru. The reason that, well, uh, because this house was modified like this with, for example, these metallic elements in the windows that are very, very beautiful, is because the creator of the museum, the owner of this museum, Mr. Rafael Larco Hoyle, was from Trujillo, from the north of Peru. And he wanted to bring elements from his homeland into uh, this place uh, that is located in Lima City, into this colonial style home, but from Lima City. This house, uh, known originally as the Fundo Cueva, the Fundo Cueva, Cueva is uh, the name of the family who used to own this house. Uh, they used to own a big plantation field of cotton. And you can see also on the other side, first of all, that we are elevated. Uh, we are quite elevated because we know that the house, the Fundo Cueva, was built on top of a pre-Hispanic temple. Can you imagine that? So that's why the house is elevated in, in comparison with the rest of the city. And to access to the house, you need uh, to go through ramps. Uh. So on the other side, there's a garden, by the way, and there is a restaurant, which is wonderful. Is the restaurant of the museum, restaurant of Larco Museum is known as one of the best we have in Lima. And you can visit this restaurant from Monday to Sunday to complete your experience within the museum. So, by the way, the whole tour, we're going to be able to see uh, Mrs. Ula Holmquist because she was the person who led this tour inside the museum and she did it all in Spanish. So I'm trying to translate uh, this uh, tour to you. So well, we're going to uh, stop, uh, first of all, this um, uh, introductory uh, section and we're going to pass to the next 
uh, video. Uh, you can also access, sorry, I'm trying to uh, change the video. You can access to this full video uh, on Facebook, okay, in the Facebook of Museo Largo. If you have also questions, please don't be shy. Share them with me here on the comment section on the chat zone. So I'm going now to change to the second part, uh, which is the uh, tour inside the museum, okay? So if you don't hear, let's say, the, the voice of the, um, of, the, of the director of the museum is because, well, uh, all the tour was made in, a, in a Spanish, okay? Uh, if you are um, good in Spanish, if you want to practice your Spanish, you can see the full length video. Uh, as you can see, I don't know if you are able to notice this here in this corner, I think. You will see that the museum length, uh, the tour, sorry, length is one hour and 25 minutes. Uh, minutes. So we're going to just hit the highlights of this uh, video. And we're going first to play the video here. Mm -hmm. And in the museum, once we get inside the old house, this uh, 18th century construction, we're going to be able to visit different rooms inside the house, different sections that have been adapted uh, uh, to tell the story that uh, Larco Museum wants to share with you all, with all the visitors. Um, of course, the, the tour inside is quite long. It takes at least one hour and a half uh, and can be even more if you want to see the erotica, the erotic gallery. So it could be two hours of experience in total. Uh, so I want to use this opportunity to, to invite you to see the museum. That's why I will not tell you each one of the pieces and, and the showcases, uh, but we're going to learn what is the, uh, the let's say, the, the, the special element in this museum, what makes it different from others. So first of all, I would like to tell you that Peru is a, a country that had lots of different societies. For example, in the section over here, you can see Epocas Peruanas, right? Peruvian epochs, basically. So we have here uh, this sort of like chart in which there are different uh, times, time periods of the history of Peru from the oldest time periods, so what, what, which are called pre-ceramic. The pre-ceramic times is the time before the invention of the, of the ceramic in Peru. We're talking about, uh, uh, let's say, 8,000 years before Christ until, let's say, uh, the first societies uh, that emerged in the country. Uh, let's say around around uh, 4,000 years ago. But we even know that in the pre-ceramic period, we had an ancient culture that nowadays is known as the mother culture of Peru. And it was a pre-ceramic society. It is the Caral culture. So Caral culture uh, is the oldest, not just of Peru, the oldest culture of Peru, also the oldest culture in the southern hemisphere uh, of the world, right? So it's very important first to start with the chart of a uh, history of uh, Peru. And later also you can see in this other section the a certification, right, a, a area. So uh, Mr. Rafael Larco Hoyle, the founder of this museum, the person who created a collection of over 45,000 pieces, he used a very interesting system to date, uh, um, let's say, the, the vessels uh, that he was discovering uh, without using carbon-14. Uh, the carbon-14 dating was invaded later after he started to, uh, to work and create this museum. So he used uh, uh, the different uh, stratas, uh, uh, the different layers in the ground to deduce how old the pieces were. Uh, Mr. Rafael Arco Hoyle, uh, it was able to access especially uh, to ceramics in the north of Peru, in the northern section of the country. In a moment, I will explain a little bit more about Mr. Rafael Larco Hoyle, uh, just uh, to show you first that Peru is a land of 
three regions. We have the coast, the Andes, and the jungle. Three complete different realities within Peru. Lima, by the way, my city is in the coast. Trujillo, where most of the work of Mr. Rafael Larco Hoyle uh, was, was uh, happened or uh, was made, was the north uh, of the country, Trujillo and Lima. But the collection Larco has vessels, has have potteries from different parts of Peru. Remember also that Peru has Andes, Peru has the Humboldt current, the coal current uh, that comes from the Antarctica up north that also cools down the temperature in the atmosphere in the coast where uh, I live where also Trujillo in the north is located, creating something really interesting, creating a desert. Oh, so we have uh, an ocean abundant in terms of fish. Uh, we have an ocean abundant uh, in terms of seabirds. Oh, and all of this abundancy in the coast made possible that the societies in that part of the country flourish quite fast. But Peru, as I was saying, is not the only uh, a great society or some great, great in the world where societies emerge. Of course, in the North Hemisphere, many other societies uh, emerge uh, pretty much parallel uh, to, to our oldest ones, uh, like Egypt, for example, China, Mesopotamia, for example, India, uh, and even in the North here in America, in Mesoamerica, as well. But what's the highlight, what is the characteristic uh, uh, of, um, let's say, our culture in Peru is the fact that we are the, the home of the oldest societies that emerge in the southern hemisphere. So that's possibly uh, the highlight, let's say, of, um, of this section. So now we're going to go a little bit farther. And I would like to also mention a little bit of what I was saying, too. Uh, so this is the map of the world. You can see uh, uh, that, uh, well, the starting point of humanity, Africa, also, is the place where about 100,000 years ago, humanity started to move towards the north, towards Europe, Asia. And later on, about 16,000 years ago, uh, the humans came into what nowadays is South America and later penetrated into what nowadays is my country is Peru, right? So I want to also have the chance of showing you a little bit of the stone heads that are located uh, uh, right next to this uh, map. And these stone heads are original, by the way. These are pieces that were recollected uh, from different temples um, in locations that were quite elevated in the Andes zone because in the coast of Peru, we did not build using stone. We built using mud bricks. Uh, most of the temples of the coast of Peru were made in mud brick. But in the Andes, because of the rain especially that is very common, uh, the temples were made of stone and also as guardians of these temples, stone heads uh, that usually had the shape or the faces of a uh, pumas or uh, felines, right? So this is really interesting because the feline is also associated in the pre-Hispanic uh, times with the world where we live, our world, right? Uh, the first religion that emerged in this part of the world uh, that, um, let's say, is a religion that basically it was shared in the whole territory of Peru, the, the foundation of this religion was not really that different in different parts of Peru, uh, was that uh, th there was a belief that the world was divided in three parts. Uh, so the part where we live, the world where we live, is represented by the puma, right? Uh, it was used, the puma, as a, as a totem, let's say, of our world. 
There is also another world, the upper world, the world of the skies, the world of the mountains, huh? the world of the sun, the moon, and that is the world uh, that uh, where the condors inhabitate. Uh, the condors are these sacred animals that are able to come to the soil where we live uh, here uh, to, to the ground, but also are able to fly up where the mountains are, uh, where the gods live, where the unseen is, right? Uh, and also there is another world, which is the world of the the ancestors, the underground world, the world of the dead. So each one of these worlds is represented by different animals. The puma, our world, the condor, the upper world, and the snake, the down world, the world of the uh, dead, right? So um, we are going also to have the chance of seeing in this moment some really interesting uh, uh, vessels, uh, a close-up into some of these vessels. So let me also go a little bit forward. Mm -hmm. And you can see here these uh, nice vessels that are exhibited in this uh, first uh, part, let's say, of the museum uh, that contains lots of ceramics, by the way. We have ceramics from different parts of the country. Uh, and Mr. Rafael Arcojoile started to recopulate, uh, to recollect these vessels from the north coast of Peru. So the style in them is the northern style uh, in terms of, of the decoration, uh, let's say. So the vessels in this first chamber where we are with Mrs. Ula Homkist, uh, the director of the Museum Larco, uh, is a, a room that has uh, potteries that date back to almost, uh, let's say, 3,000 years ago. So 3,000 years old potteries, and look how good they look. And we can see here, for example, the image of a snake uh, represented. Remember, these are uh, sacred characters, sacred animals uh, that uh, show, for example, uh, uh, like some uh, elements of, of the totems uh, that symbolize each one of these worlds. We have, for example, uh, the snake from the underworld. Remember, we have uh, uh, the snake representing the world of the dead, the world of the unseen, the world where the the crops grow also, no? So it is a world not really of, of, of death, it's a world also where life grows. No? Uh, as for example, the womb of a mother that is in darkness, within the womb of a mother there is darkness, there is humidity also, and there the seed of life starts. Uh, that's the idea also the ancient people of Peru had about the and the world, right? So that's why also the dead, oh, when they were going inside the soil and they were put like in fetal position, fetal embryonary position, um, they were in a way fertilizing the soil again with their own cells, right? Uh, we have also all the vessels here. For example, we can see owls, and the owls are related not just with the upper world. They are related with the world of what's the, the female side, right? So darkness, uh, the nighttime was also associated with the moon and therefore with uh, the, the female, the femininity, you know, the, the female, uh, uh, let's say, elements of life. Right, we have also a puma over here, right? So, representing this world where we live. These vessels you are seeing here, oh, this selection over here, and also most of the vessels in Larco Museum are vessels that were discovered in tombs. Therefore, they were not domestic vessels. They were not vessels that were used for, you know, like drinking from them or just for carrying uh, like water only. No, they were uh, vessels that were valuable because of the messages uh, that were inscripted uh, in, in them, right? And uh, with this inscription, I'm talking about all uh, the symbols, the symbolism in 
these um, in these different uh, vessels, right? Um, so this is, by the way, the the this part of the museum that is called the room or the hall of the cultures, right? So we are going also to go to another uh, important, uh, let's say, uh, piece, or uh, to just keep going, mm, and. We are going also to have the chance of talking about the importance of women in the pre-Hispanic times. Uh, because women in pre-Hispanic times uh, were not considered uh, to be uh, inferior to men. But I have a question from Jane. Thank you so much, Jane, for, for your question. Are those owls? Yes, Jane, exactly. You, you possibly noticed uh, the, the, the shape of them, the, the faces uh, of these uh, birds were the faces of owls. And the owls, uh, also related with the upper world, were connected also with the uh, femininity because they are related with the night time. And the night is connected with uh, being a woman, the night is is for for the women, or is related with the women, and the daytime with the men. The moon, female; the sun, male. Mm -hmm. uh, in this section, we can see a stella, a, a stone carved. Uh, this is sandstone, by the way. It's one of the most important pieces in the collection. Oh, my pleasure, Jane. No worries. <laughs> so this. Uh, piece is called uh, the obelisk of Pacopampa or also the lady of Pacopampa uh, and this piece of a stone represents a female entity a female could be a shamaness a priestess uh, a, a person of power with that that was a, a female, right? And we can clearly see in this section between her legs, uh, we can see a bulba. Can you see the bulba here, my friends? It's clearly a female, it's not a male. We don't have a, a phallus there. Uh, but this bulba is a special because it has teeth. Uh, so it's really interesting you know, seeing that this bulba, which is, uh, of course, as, as it is, you know, a, 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 let's say a vagina is, is uh, capable to give birth, to give uh, like children, right, to the world, but also because it has teeth, it is capable to destroy or uh, to kill. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is also referring to the capacity of this, uh, this, this person, this entity of giving life, but as well destroying it. Uh, so the lady of Pacopampa, this Estella, was discovered in the Andes of Peru. Um, and uh, what is very interesting is where this piece was discovered, very close to it, also years later, were, um, also was discovered a burial, which I'm going to pay, make a stop here just for a moment to show you something really interesting. Um, so here, let me show you the lady of Pacopampa. So you can see here, first of all, the bones that were discovered very close to where the Stella used to be. And um, the person who was buried there was a, was a woman. And she was very special because she had the skull deform. So the skull deformation was just given to children that were very special, that belonged to high status groups or families that were uh, born to rule. And something important is that this body, uh, this mummy was discovered wearing earrings. These long earrings you can see here, the, the interesting part is that uh, the Estella, look at this, the Estella have the same design of earrings on the sides. So the belief is that this Estella really represents uh, the this woman uh, that was buried there that probably was a sort of like shaman of the community, a leader of the community. One last detail, this person has sort of like this vomiting, this sort of like 
uh, uh, fluid coming out of her mouth. And it seems, a specialist believe, is related with the intake of hallucinogenic plants and the vomiting that is caused by intaking those plants. Huh? So uh, plants such as, for example, cactus San Pedro or, uh, let's say, in the jungle, the ayahuasca. Huh? So we're going to continue also uh, with another section. And now we are going to see vessels that are related with symbolism, with pre-Hispanic symbolism. And I think you're going to be surprised with how interesting some of these vessels discovered in tombs can be and how much information in terms, in terms of, let's say, um, symbols they can carry. For example, here we can see these, uh, these three vessels in the front, they look different in, in terms of the decoration. Uh, similar, of course, in terms of how they were designed, right? So with this sort of like handle, which is not a handle. This section is very, fra uh, let's say, fragile. Uh, but I will later explain what this means, this sort of like handle and the big in the center, in the middle. Um, so we have these three vessels. This one here, for example, that is quite simple in terms of the painting in it. It is um, divided sort of like in two sections, right? We have one side painted in red, the other side painted in white. And what is very curious is that in the upper part, we have the opposite color, right, of, of each one. Mm -hmm. And at the end, the, the tip, is also, again, the color in the lower uh, part. So uh, the specialists believe that this vessel, for example, represents the duality, uh, what is masculine and feminine, uh, the female, male, um, which was necessary for just for life to exist. Uh, so uh, also, it, it looks a lot like yin and yang when you look at from the top. Uh, it's, it's interesting because in each one of the sides, there is the opposite color. Uh, in the masculine, there's a little bit of feminine and vice versa as well. We have also some other vessels. For example, this one here, the spiral, uh, the spiral related with the time. Uh, that's the, the concept of time in the pre-Hispanic uh, uh, period, right? And um, also the idea that that life is not like a, a line. Uh, it is always going in circles, almost around the same place. You're able also to contact your ancestors and also being able to be close to the ancestors, people who live in the past, uh, in this time where you are, right? Um, also interesting is that uh, this this uh, sort of like a spiral, it ends uh, uh, where the peak is located, right? And for example, in this other one, we have another interesting group of symbols. We have three steps, and the three steps are related with the three worlds, uh, the upper world, this world, and the underworld, right? So maybe you remember we were talking about the symbol, listen, behind uh, the idea of, you know, worshiping the puma, worshiping the condor, worshiping the snake. And these vessels, because they were made by a culture, uh, culture from the coast, uh, they are also, they always have elements from the sea. This sort of like an element on top uh, that is sort of like, curvy on top, uh, is related also with the rain. Uh, it also could be related with water, the ocean, the waves. But the archaeologists uh, believe, uh, Mrs. Ula Homkis believe that it is more related with sort of like a petition uh, for rain, uh, um, let's say, to happen rain in the Andes, right? In the Andes. Uh, so this was the idea of the rain in the Andes. Uh, in this uh, case, for example, Achilles is pointing out the interesting idea that this, the beginning of this spiral is connected also with the spot on top. And the spots also were very important uh, element in these vessels. Uh, they were not uh, vessels that, of, of the kind of, you know, just domestic to drink from them uh, because they were supposed to go with the dead to the afterworld. 
But the idea of pouring water in them and that the water will at the same time separate into these two sides, what is the masculine and the feminine side, and then connect inside in, in, in a center, in a, in a middle, uh, like uniting again, is also very interesting. Might have been also very, very profound uh, and very important for ceremonies related with the after life. Uh, we are also seeing again a little bit of this uh, design of the three steps related also with the three worlds. And now I want to also show you another selection that I have for you. And in this case, we're going to talk about the portrait vessels. Have you ever hear about the portrait vessels uh, of the Mochica, mm. probably you haven't seen uh, such sophistic vessels uh, before. These are pre-Inca vessels and they were made by an ancient society called Mochica or Moche. Gracias, Alison. I'm, I'm so happy you were able to hear about them. Uh, the uh, portrait vessels of the Mochica Uh, or, or much culture uh, are considered to be uh, the finest uh, human reproductions from pre-Hispanic times. You can see, first of all, that comparing the size of the vessel and the size uh, of the head of, of the archaeologist, uh, they are very, very close to a real human size. And uh, these vessels Probably, this is the, the speculation of the archaeologists, uh, were sort of like animated once they receive liquid water in them. Um, the way how beautifully people from all Peru were represented in these vessels is fantastic. It's amazing. You can see all uh, the um, uh, sort of like uh, features, not just of people from the old times in Peru, also people that nowadays you can see in Peru in different parts of the country. Uh, the belief is that these were representations of leaders of, of that time, probably uh, could be rulers or soldiers. And we speculate that because of the fashion that the These vessels have, like for example, some of them have conic shaped hats, which are related with soldiers, or also very nice earrings or uh, nose rings, right? Or facial painting. Uh, but we don't think, or especially don't think, that these vessels were pictures of the people who were buried uh, uh, with them, right? So they were representations of, of high status people or leaders uh, or even gods, also mytho mythological people of that ancient time. Uh, um, so those were the portrait vessels. Hmm? So um, I would like also to show you here in the next section uh, other style of potteries. We saw that in the case of the no, more like a northern style potteries uh, of, of Peru, of the Mochica or Moche culture, most of the vessels had one handle and one pick on the top or something that looked like a handle, right? And one tip uh, in the top. But here we have different kinds of them. So these are whistlers. Oh, these are whistlers, vessels that produce music when you pull inside water. So if you move the water inside, and they have been tested, by the way, and, and, and also uh, investigated largely, vastly by the archaeologists of this museum, They produce beautiful sound that's caused by the movement of the water, the pressure the water uh, makes to, towards, uh, let's say, the other chambers when you are moving them, the water inside. Here you can see, for example, a vessel that has a representation of uh, a muscle that is called a spondylus that was considered a sacred Uh, it's sort of like a shell or, or, or muscle in the pre-Hispanic times and only lives in warm waters. So we have in Peru the Humboldt current. It's a cold current of water. 
That means that the, my, my ancestors, the ancestors of, of the Peruvians in the north of Peru, in the north coast, they had to uh, keep trading constantly uh, local products for products that were not local but were highly, highly requested with northern cultures, like for example, cultures in Ecuador or in Colombia. And uh, well, these mussels that grow naturally in warmer waters were also requested here, and they were so special that they were even represented in potteries. This is pottery, by the way. Also notice that we have two peaks instead of just one in, in uh, the vessel we just seen. So now I want to show you uh, how uh, the, the techniques of creation of potteries variate according to the location in Peru. So I will be moving the video a little bit forward now. So we will get to learn about the Nazca culture. Have you heard, my friends, about the Nazca culture before? The Nazca society, by the way, is one of the most famous we have in Peru, one of the most famous pre-Hispanic societies of Peru. And they appeared also in the coast of Peru, but in the south coast of Peru. Uh, in the north, we had the Mochica, the creators of this portrait, very realistic, ultra-realistic vessels. And in the south, we had people who created beautiful vessels also, colorful, with more or less 13 colors sometimes used at the same time in each one of their potteries, but that used a technique that was more flat in terms of three-dimensionality. Now, they were more, uh, let's say, simple in terms of the, of the designs they did when we talk about three-dimensional designs, but they were very colorful vessels. The Nazca culture is famous because of their lines, the Nazca lines. Maybe you hear about the, the lines in the desert, uh, the famous, famous lines uh, that can be seen only from the air, right? So um, here we have some excellent examples of the Nazca style, colorful, flat in, term, in terms of three-dimensionality, uh, but also their vessels have secret messages that uh, are sometimes very creepy. Some of these vessels have the representation of heads that have been chopped off, right? <laughs> uh, Sassinated uh, during ceremonies, right? We have also some of the vessels like the one over here that shows a, um, a trophy head. Maybe you've heard about the concept of trophy heads. Uh, these heads that were chopped off uh, from, from people, dried, uh, brain was removed, tongue removed, eyeballs removed, and then uh, treated in a way that will remain with some, let's say, um, impression of certain, uh, let's say, uh, like humanity, let's say, in them still, although uh, they are just, you know, assassinated heads. So the Nazca people uh, used to deform the skulls of their children, the ones that were part of the highest status, the high class of the group. Group, that the formation of the skulls was very important as a way of this distinction, a distinction system among all the groups and also lower class people. And in some of the vessels, we can see deformation uh, in the skulls of the people represented, right? So remember that when you come to Peru, you have to see the Nazca lines if possible, please. Uh, oh, yeah, and I'm so happy you're enjoying. This is just a highlight tour of the museum. I don't want, of course, uh, to, to ruin the experience inside the museum. There are so many more vessels, so many more things to see. And now I would like to show you, so we haven't seen anything in wood, right? So I think we have to see something in wood. That would be super good because in that way we'll have the chance of, experimenting also, this is going to come in a moment, uh, uh, how was the work also in this material, in the wood? We've seen ceramic. We have uh, this very rare 
example of woodwork. Uh, um, museums in Peru usually don't have wood because it's a material that uh, degrades and, and, and rots uh, very, very easily. It gets damaged very easily. So it usually doesn't last long. But this figurine you see here, this idol you see here, was made by a culture called Chincha. The Chincha culture coexisted with the Incas, the last empire of Peru. And I don't know if you, if you can uh, maybe have an idea of what this person is holding in the hand. Do you have any idea what it could be? Would you like to maybe guess what this could be? Many people say it looks like a cell phone. <laughs> like he's trying to do a picture. Um, the shape uh, that you say is sort of like a, uh, um, it's sort of like a, a, a rectangle, right? And if you want to know what it is, well, it is really uh, this sort of like um, uh, pictures or, or glasses, right? Uh, that used to contain, and in the museum you can see some of those examples, I think the archaeologist is trying also to show a little, a little bit of those uh, sort of like um, containers, vessels also to drink chicha, chicha. So what is chicha? Chicha is a drink made from corn. It's a drink made from corn that was also a, a put uh, to macerate in vessels like the one you see here, right? So these vessels are called arivalos, but arivalo is a Greek word, by the way. So the Quechua name for these vessels is urku, and the urkus were these big pots, uh, these big uh, ceramics, where the drink of chicha was uh, storage uh, and was fermented. Chicha is a light beer, uh, just to try to describe it in a way. And it was used also in important ceremonies because it was alcoholic also. It was a fundamental part of ceremonies in the pre-Hispanic times. Uh, the whole idea of, of getting a little bit drunk also, the euphoria, the drunkness, drunkness can bring also to, to people, uh, um, can, it could also be or was really a very important part of these events, right? So you can see also the shape, very interesting. It looks really very, very humane, right? It has a neck, it has a body, it has sort of like arms, these this handles on the side, or possibly used to carry this big uh, vessel. Uh, and also this lower section that was inserted in the ground and uh, in a way also ergonomic because in that way you could or maybe uh, lean it on a, on a side and serve the liquid in these vessels, uh, in this sort of like a, um, let's say glasses, let's say, uh, that were made in the case, the ones you've seen, of wood. So usually these vessels were made in twos, uh, so they were too similar. And the idea was that when you got into a, a place that was sacred or, or even into the house of a person during a, a special moment, you will be invited uh, with one of these, uh, let's say, uh, glasses, um, chicha, and the other person that will receive you will drink from the other one, the other pair, no? the other similar, and both will be drinking at the same time, right? So this is a little bit of what we have in Larco Museum. This is the official video of Larco Museum. And we have today explored together the room of the cultures. But there is more uh, to see, uh, to be honest, in this, uh, in this museum. And I am planning to show you also other parts of the museum in a part two of this uh, series. Bernhard, thank you so much for your tip, amigo. Thanks for your tip support. Uh, so if you want me, I would like to do a part two in which we will be able to see the room of the fabrics, uh, the textiles room. We're going to be able to see also the room of the 
human sacrifice, uh, and we're going to be able to see as well the section where the jewelry is. Uh, so uh, I hope uh, you would like to come to our part two. I am planning to do it um, tomorrow around this time. So I will be posting again this uh, this uh, tour on, on Hago, uh, updated for the part two. And also, there will be a part three. Oh, Julie, I'm so happy you would like to come tomorrow. Um, gracias, Adrian and Mia. Thank you. Uh, there will be a part three in which we're going to be able to see the erotic gallery of this museum. Thank you, Rodney. Muchas gracias. Don't forget, please, to follow the channel uh, of, um, let's say, Facebook of the Museum Larco, which is, once again, this one here. Uh, you will love, love, love uh, all the posts that we have uh, there. And also, I am sharing here with you an image with all my information. If you wish to follow my Hago channel, my social media, uh, if you want to follow uh, my website also, there you have all my information. I'm super happy to receive you, to have you, to receive your questions. I do city tours in Lima, in-person city tours, uh, like uh, uh, to different parts of Lima, anywhere in Lima. Thank you, Julie. Muchas gracias. And um, if you ever come to Lima, please think uh, in, in, in contacting me. I, I would love to have you in the city, show you my place, show you my uh, beloved Lima. Uh, also, I have a YouTube channel with previous tours. So maybe you would like to see a little bit of Lima with my, with my YouTube. So all my information is on my bio in HeyGo. And uh, you can also follow me if you wish to get updates on my upcoming tours. This is a very modest channel, but I try to bring interesting content to you. And for me, it's very important to hear your comments, what you would like to see next. So uh, I hope you can see tomorrow the part two of this event. You can join. And uh, also, um, if you have any solicitude about any other theme you would like me to join, please, please just share with me anytime. I'm, I'm happy to receive your comments. Muchas gracias, Ronnie. Mwah, gracias. Take care. Have a lovely rest of the day, the evening, the night, the morning, and hope to see you tomorrow. Gracias, Bernhard. Thank you. Thank you, amigo. <laughs> see, I, I really hope you can come and practice your Spanish also with your official video from the museum, please. Also, uh, see you tomorrow. All the best to you. See you soon. If you're not able to come tomorrow, uh, take care and hasta la vista. <laughs> Until the next time. Bye-bye, amigos. Ciao, ciao. Thank you.